Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Melissa Bombick with the Acoustic Neuroma Association. I want to welcome you to our second Facebook Live of AN Awareness Week 2020. And thank you for everyone who is with us today. Uh, we are very excited to welcome Tamara Whalen, um, who is going to join us. She's a physician assistant with UC San Diego. And she is going to talk to us today about what to expect in the period immediately following surgery for acoustic neuroma. So she's got a few slides, and then we will be taking questions. Uh, so if you have those, you can go ahead and post them in the comments, and we will um, do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, but Tamara, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. And um, I know that um, we're really excited to hear what you have to say. There's lots of people that will be anxious to hear this. So um, if you wanna go ahead and get to your slides, we can start there. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Melissa. Well, I'm transitioning to my slideshow here. Um, thank you to Melissa and the ANA for actually organizing this Acoustic Neuroma Awareness Week program. I think it's been a great opportunity for all of us who are sheltering in place to get together and share information in this unusual period in, in time. So I think it's a great opportunity you've capitalized on. And thank you to Chris Sywick, our program manager, um, for also putting things together on our end. Um, I'm going to... Um, talk to you today about acoustic neuroma surgery and what to expect in the immediate, immediate post-op period. Um, as you probably know, I am a physician assistant here at UC San Diego Health with Dr. Friedman and Dr. Schwartz. And uh, one of my big roles here is to take care of the patients in the post-operative period um, in the hospital and as they're discharged from the hospital. So, um, I know all of our acoustic neuroma patients um, go through a lot of decision-making um, from the time they're diagnosed with an acoustic neuroma to the time they decide to proceed with surgery. So I am going to start at the page where, okay, now you've decided to have surgery. What are the next uh, series of questions I need to ask and research and know about? Um, in terms of what to expect following the surgery. So in this um, hour with you today, I hope to talk about, um, first of all, the basic kind of general feel of what to expect during the hospital, how long I'll be, I'll be in the hospital, what to expect, where will I be, will I have lots of tubes and drains. Um, then I want to talk to talk about symptoms you'll be experiencing, what are the most common symptoms, that people experience and what um, can I expect to prepare myself for in terms of symptoms. And I will also talk about how we manage them and hopefully allay a lot of fears about um, having surgery. I know patients get very anxious um, thinking about um, post-operative um, symptoms. And I wanna just reassure everyone that most um, symptoms can be managed quite well. And then next, I will uh, talk a little bit about um, complications after acoustic neuroma surgery and what are important things to be on the lookout for. And lastly, I'll touch a little bit on um, our acoustic neuroma team because it's not just your surgeons, your doctors, your nurses. There is a whole team of people that will be involved in your post-operative care to help uh, you recover well. Um, so first I'll start from the point of surgery. So once the surgery is complete, um, Usually you'll be extubated, meaning the breathing tube from the surgery will remove, be removed while you're still in the operating room at the end of the surgery. And then they'll bring you to the PACU, PACU meaning post anesthesia care unit, where they'll monitor you for a short period of time after anesthesia to make sure everything's okay. Then your first night in the hospital is going to be in the ICU. 
The reason um, we have you stay in the ICU is because we'll want to monitor you very, very closely after craniotomy. And the ICU has a good ratio of nurses to patients, meaning the nurses will be a very attentive to all of your needs. Um, we'll be checking you uh, very closely and frequently. So expect that your vital signs will be checked hourly. We'll check your temperature, your blood pressure, how, how you're breathing, your heart rate. Um, and also they'll be doing neurological checks about every hour uh, to check test your neurological function, as well as your cranial nerve functions. I know a lot of patients, one of their biggest concerns is going to be your um, facial nerve, and so that will be monitored very closely. Um, you'll also have a number of um, lines and tubes during that first night. For example, you'll likely have an arterial line, which is a catheter in an artery. And why you have this is so that we can have real-time measurements of your blood pressure. So you'll be very closely monitored. Um, you'll also have a urinary catheter in place. Off, that will typically be placed at the time of surgery and it will stay in for the first night as it may be difficult for you to get out of bed the first night. For our patients having a retrosigmoid um, craniotomy approach, um, a lumbar drain is typically placed at the time of surgery. So this will also stay in at least for the first um, post for, for the first night after surgery. Um, in the ICU, you'll also be given a lot of your medications via IV. So you'll have IV fluids, you'll have steroids, which we give in the immediate um, post-operative period for um, swelling and inflammation. And you'll also have a short course of antibiotics to prevent infection. These are all standard medications that everybody receives around the time of surgery. Um, we'll also be giving um, the nurses will also be monitoring your pain and nausea symptoms, and um, most of the um, medications will be given IV for that first night. Um, so you won't have to be worried about swallowing any medications when you're nauseous or anything. Everything will be in IV form. Sometimes in the first night, you'll also need some post-operative imaging, routine imaging after surgery, just to um, check and make sure there's no um, post-surgical concerns. And sometimes also additional lab work um, to check, for example, your blood counts to make sure there's not some concern of excessive bleeding. We'll check electrolytes and sodium levels. So the first night is, um, you know, there will be a lot of activity in your room, so it may be hard for you to rest, but hopefully between the checks, you'll, you'll be able to get a little bit of rest. By the next morning, a post-operative day one, that's usually when I first see our patients, uh, they're usually doing much better. Often when I come in in the morning, patients may be sitting up in bed already, maybe sipping on some liquids. So at that time, um, hopefully we'll be ready to bring you out of the ICU level of care to, um, to a level of care which will involve less frequent checks instead of, for example, every hour of checking vital signs and checking your neurological function, they'll go down to every two or four hours. Um, on this day, typically we start to remove all the ex excessive catheters and lines that we have placed as well. For example, the arterial line typically comes out, your cath urinary catheter will come out, and the lumbar drain will come out. So you'll start feeling a little more normal without so many um, additional lines and tubes and drains. And um, at this point, usually people are starting um, ready to start taking more by mouth. Like I said, first we'll start slow. We'll start with liquids and um, you'll start advancing to maybe soft food. And then um, as you feel ready, you can start a normal diet. Um, at the same time that you're taking things by mouth, however, we will continue the IV fluids rather aggressively throughout your whole hospital stay. And the reason we do this is just to prevent any um, concerns for um, clotting in, in the brain. So, so you will likely have IV fluids throughout your whole hospital course. Um, the biggest activity, however, that occurs, and we try to get this um, 
to happen on post-op day one is uh, to get you out of bed and to get you walking. This usually starts first with our nurses and our nurses in our ICU here are amazing. Um, they'll uh, start by getting you out of bed um, as soon as you're ready in the morning, even if it's just to sit up in a chair and maybe have breakfast. And then usually by later in the day, the occupational therapy team may come by and the physical therapy team will come by to start your vestibular therapy and get you walking as this is gonna be one of the most important things to get you on the road to feeling better. Um, additionally, we'll also call on um, our integrative medicine team and Dr. Chen, who hopefully you'll all meet later this week and when she does her talk um, to help with some of the post-operative um, symptoms and side effects. Um, you'll, most of our patients typically stay in the hospital about an average of three days. So um, you'll stay two additional days after that typically and post-op day two until you're ready for discharge will be um, continued work on those same types of issues. So continued work with physical therapy and occupational therapy every day and uh, just work on um, tolerating your um, eating and drinking without difficulty. So increasing your diet, increasing the amount of fluid you're drinking and um, what you can take um, by mouth. And then um, as soon as we can, we'd like to transition you to the oral medicines from the IV medicines, as these are the medicines you'll go home on. Um, believe it or not, on post-operative day two, that's the day when we typically take the dressing off of your head. So right after surgery, the surgeons place a very tight mastoid dressing over your head. So you look a little bit like a mummy. Um, and sometimes that can be a little uncomfortable, but it's good, especially um, to keep some pressure on the the wound for healing. Um, but by day two, we can typically take that off and by day three, you can even shower. Um, you can wash your hair, shower, and keep the incision nice and clean. In addition to the incision that's going to be on um, the, at the site of the craniotomy, you're also going to have a, a small incision on your belly where we take the fat graft for um, fat graft from from your belly. Um, but this incision should be a relatively small incision, maybe one to two, in, uh, about two inches in length and should be pretty low maintenance. It's typically covered with glue after and should be, um, need very little care. Um, so that's kind of where you'll be in the hospital and what you'll be doing in the hospital. But I think the biggest question most patients have is how am I gonna feel? Am I gonna be feeling horrible? Am I gonna be so nauseous? Am I gonna be vomiting? Um, am I gonna be in so much pain? Um, so I've put together this list of um, the most common types of symptoms that patients will experience. Um, the first one being the nausea and vomiting. Um, nausea and vomiting is probably um, caused by two different factors. Number one is probably from anesthesia and medications making you feel nauseous. And the other thing is uh, likely a component of nausea and vomiting from um, your vestibular dysfunction. So at the time of the surgery, as you know, the vestibular nerve is severed on the side of the tumor and um, that lack of vestibular input can be disorienting and make you dizzy, but it can also give you symptoms of na um, nauseousness. So to manage the nausea and vomiting, uh, we use multiple medications. Um, typically, uh, for those who are familiar with nausea medications, we use Zofran, but we have a couple of other medications we use that we can add if need be. Um, we just uh, try to avoid as much as we can any um, nausea medicine that may act on the vestibular system because we don't want to, we want your vestibular system to be challenged and to uh, retrain itself rather than um, to cover up any um, effects with an anti-nausea medicine. Um, the other patients 
uh, other thing patients complain of is like, oh, I, I just really don't have an appetite. Things don't taste right. And that's okay. That is um, not uncommon after surgery. So what I encourage the patients to do is just slowly take what they can, start with the fluids and um, ma maintain hydration as much as possible and slowly start off with maybe something soft and advance as you feel able. And with time, things will your appetite will come back. The change in taste can often be caused by um, facial nerve um, um, irritation. So sometimes things will taste a little bit off, but that tends to improve with time as well. Um, dizziness. Dizziness is something that is very common, of course, again, after cutting the vestibular nerve. Um, it can be very disorienting and cause dizziness. So the way we check for that is checking for nystagmus or checking your eye movements. Um, and this can be the amount of dizziness patients have can be somewhat variable. Um, but what I can say is no matter how dizzy you are on day one, usually by day two when I come to see you, um, your nystagmus has improved greatly. And by day three, it's impro improved even further. So um, it improves um, rather rapidly. And the best thing for dizziness, as um, Ben talked about yesterday in his talk uh, on vestibular therapy, is um, retraining your brain. So sitting up in a chair as soon as um, you're able, and as much as you're able, and walking. Um, those seem counterintuitive <laughs> to things to do when you're dizzy, but actually they will help you feel better. Uh, the next category, of course, is headache, incisional pain, and neck pain. Everyone, of course, it's a natural fear to be worried about pain. Um, but I like to categorize the pain into three different categories uh, for our patients. Um, there is a component of headache that often occurs. There's also the incisional pain that you have from um, the surgery itself, and there's also neck pain. Often the neck pain can be um, significant after our surgeries, especially with um, uh, approaches that may have your head positioned a certain way for a longer period of time. So depending on the type of pain you're having, we usually go after the pain um, um, with different agents. So if it's more of a headache type pain, we feel Tylenol usually works best for that. And actually, if you're a caffeine drinker, we'll encourage you to drink caffeine because that can also help with um, post-op headaches. If you're having more of an incisional pain, we tend to um, give you more narcotic um, to help with the pain. If it's more of a neck stiffness or neck ache, um, therapies like heat, ice, or even topical lidocaine patches can be very helpful. And of course, our magic potion is Dr. Chen from osteopathic medicine and her osteomanipulative therapy patients find extremely helpful um, um, to help cut their pain down. Um, the next symptom is one that patients don't often think about, but sometimes after surgery, there can be a fair amount of jaw soreness and stiffness. And this is from the surgical approach and um, the muscle um, stretching during surgery. So we often can have speech therapy come by and they will assess to make sure you're able to swallow safely and give any advice on um, recommendations to help with that soreness and stiffness. And also Dr. Chen, again, <laughs> our miracle worker is often um, helpful in reducing um, some of that stiffness. And also I've seen her done do great things in increasing patients' uh, jaw mobility with just a few sessions. So if you are having that symptom, that's one to um, talk to her about. Um, vision changes. Vision changes uh, can be quite common. It can be in the form of um, just a double vision. Um, 
or difficulty focusing, and sometimes people have light sensitivity. And also I lumped in there is also some eye dryness. And if their eye is dry, then that can give you some visual um, difficulty with your vision. So we um, monitor these types of changes closely and um, eye lubrication is quite important in the post-operative period. Um, for patients with ha having hearing preservation surgery, there can be lots of unusual sensations in the ear. Um, and often it can be a little confusing for the patients to know if they have um, hearing intact or not, because um, they may have hearing, but they say, oh, my ear feels a little muffled. Um, sometimes that can be like a sense of fullness um, due to fluid um, in the ear after surgery, and that can subside with time. So um, we wait until the post-op audiogram to really assess the hearing in full. Patients um, who have ringing or tinnitus, sometimes immediately post-op can note improvement. Sometimes it can stay the same, or sometimes it can be more intense in the immediate post-op. But in the immediate post-op period, a lot of things can change. So um, it's we usually just advise you kind of take time um, and see how things ease up in the next days to weeks. Um, and then lastly, fatigue. You will be tired. Um, you're having a major brain surgery, so it is going to be tiring on your body. So hopefully you'll have time to rest in between um, the visits and care from your providers. Um, but we do ask that you try to maintain a regular cycle. So try to take shorter naps during the day and try to uh, take keep sleeping to nighttime hours, because the sooner as you can get back to your normal um, schedule, the better, better you'll do and the better you'll feel. Um, next, um, I wanted to touch on um, some of the concerning things that you need to be on the lookout for after you're discharged from the hospital. Of course, these are not um, that common to um, complications to have, but um, when you're recovering at home, the important things you need to look for are signs of a CSF leak after acoustic neuroma surgery, um, any pain which isn't controlled with a narcotic pain medicine or is unusual in character, any sign of delayed facial nerve weakness, and any um, sign of infection. So of course, CSF leak um, is on everybody's mind and they always have lots of questions about CSF leak and concerns for CSF leak and what to look for. Um, if you were to have a CSF leak, you would have um, dripping from your nose. It would be only from the nostril on the side of the surgery and it would be a very continuous and watery drip. So if, if someone uh, calls and says, oh, I'm having, I had a meal and then I had some drainage from both sides, it was a little bit thick, that's not um, concerning for CSF leak. This would be a very watery um, uh, type of fluid coming from your nose and clear, and it wouldn't be thick. And it, again, would only be on the side of surgery, not the opposite side, just the same side. Um, sometimes with CSF, um, CSF leak, you can have leaking from the incision. So any um, clear drainage from the incision would be something you'd wanna call your provider about to just um, touch base with them about. And any clear drainage from the ear would also be a concern that you'd wanna to touch base um, with your provider about. Um, the other signs of things to look for at, um, at home are pain which is uncontrolled and does not respond to um, narcotic pain medicine. Um, it is totally normal to have pain in the post-operative period and the week after discharge, but if you're having severe, unusual pain that does not um, get any relief after taking the medication, that would be something of more concern and, as, and if it was associated with any neck stiffness as well. 
um, delayed facial weakness. I did want to talk a little bit about that because there is um, a, a rare uh, possibility that patients can develop a weakness of their face, even though they wake up after surgery with a completely um, intact facial nerve with a complete function. Uh, we don't know why, but sometimes there is delayed um, weakness after and this can occur a few days after surgery or sometimes a few weeks. So if that were to happen, we usually encourage you to try call your provider because sometimes a course of steroids may be considered um, to help with that um, symptom. And lastly, any signs of infection. If there's any concern for um, redness, pus, drainage over the wound, um, or any warmth or fevers, um, we'd want you to call. It's unusual to have any temperature after you've been discharged for the hospital. So I would, um, if you have any fever, um, I think that would warrant a call right away to your provider. Um, lastly, I just wanted to touch base on um, the team members who will be involved in your care after acoustic neuroma surgery. And I know we've um, touched on them throughout what we've talked about so far, but I just kind of organized them into one page here. Um, so immediately in the hospital, you will likely um, be cared for as we talked about by the vestibular rehabilitation team, physical therapy. They'll be a very integral part of um, your care. Uh, occupational therapy as well, um, especially those who are more in need of assistance with their activities of daily living. For example, for some patients who have, are having more difficulties with routine activities like showering or standing up and brushing their teeth, occupational therapy will play a more significant role in their care. Speech therapy, um, this they can become involved in your care more if there's any issues with swallowing or with speech. Um, um, and then the alternative therapies, just like the integrative medicine team, um, Dr. Chen in osteopathic medicine or Vu Athens, who unfortunately can't be with us this week for our um, awareness week, but she does mindfulness and meditation. Um, these are great adjunctive therapies that can be very helpful in your recovery. And lastly, I put on there ophthalmology. So in some patients who may um, experience some facial nerve weakness and have um, dry eye as a result, perhaps if their eye a lid isn't um, getting complete closure, we do like to get ophthalmology on board um, as soon as possible, mostly as a preventative measure. Um, and we have them evaluate your cornea and offer suggestions for eye care uh, and dryness. Um, this next page um, is another group of um, people who will be involved in your care, though their care will typically come at a later stage in your recovery, not in the immediate first couple of weeks, but typically later. For example, for patients with um, more tumors involving more significant facial nerve injury. Um, we have facial nerve specialists who will also be giving talks this week, uh, Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Green here at UCSD. Um, and they can do different therapies such as Botox or eyelid weight placements in certain scenarios. Um, we also have um, the audiology team um, and I know Dr. Kari is going to be talking um, more about this later this week and hearing aids and considerations for patients with single-sided deafness after acoustic neuroma surgery. Um, and then we do have physical therapy. Um, we have Lori Heinrich, um, Heinrichsen who does facial nerve therapy here at UCSD. This is um, for facial nerve weakness, though we generally don't like to start any fa facial nerve therapy or facial nerve physical therapy until there has been some resumption of function. So this is usually a later stage referral. 
um, your PCP. Your PCP also plays a role in your recovery because as you know, um, this um, it's not light stuff, this acoustic neuroma surgery. So uh, patients often can have components of anxiety and depression, which can be either pre-existing or can be exacerbated by the surgery. So um, effective management of these um, um, anxiety and depression can be important in your recovery and your overall well-being. Um, other, in addition to um, the alternative medicine, medical therapies that we talked about in-house, some patients also benefit from other therapies such as acupuncture and massage uh, in the later post-op periods. And um, yoga, um, I'm, I put the name of yogasupport.org on as a resource. Uh, yogasupport.org um, offers um, um, yoga as a therapy for our AN patients. It can be very helpful and act as um, a way of retraining your vestibular system as well as um, mindfulness. So it's a very effective treatment. And lastly, I do mention um, local support groups, especially now um, with everything being online. Um, I encourage you all to reach out to your local support groups because um, I know in the patients we see here, they benefit greatly from talking to others who are going through the same things that they're going to going through. So they can be, uh, they can find a lot of um, relief uh, in talking to patients with um, going through similar issues. Um, so I just have a few closing thoughts before we um, open up to your questions. Um, and that is just about the uh, recovery process in general. I want you to always remember that each of you are unique patients and that you all will have a unique recovery process. So it's important to gather information and talk to others about what they go through, but remember that um, you are unique and you're not going to follow the exact path that others take and that's okay and that is 100% normal. Um, so while it's good to talk to others, you don't, um, just because you don't follow the exact course that the others are taking doesn't mean that your recovery is um, not as successful as theirs. I also encourage um, everyone to remember that recovery takes time. I feel we are so fortunate here to have such amazing patients, well-informed patients, well-motivated patients. Um, but um, one thing you can't do with hard work or effort is make recovery happen overnight. It does take time. So you have to be realistic and patient with yourself and, and things will, I promise, improve with time. Um, another comment I have is that progress in recovery is not always linear and often comes in fits and spurts. And this uh, is a quote I partially uh, stole from Chris Seiwick, who is amazing. Um, and and it, it's true, though, that often patients feel um, that they're not doing well if um, they haven't quite made progress in, in a short period of time, but sometimes um, the way we improve is um, with different periods of challenge. Um, so just keep this in mind, uh, just because you're not um, progressing in a linear fashion does not mean you're not um, making progress. And sometimes it can just take a little time. And um, the next one is just to comment about AN surgery overall, that it is a very emotional journey and, and understandably so from the time of diagnosis through the time of deciding which um, path of management you want to take um, to going through the highs and lows of surgery and to um, adjusting to your new normal. It is um, it, it, it can be a, a roller coaster and an emotional one at that. So um, I encourage you all to not be afraid to lean on your friends and family and your support network um, and, and you'll get through it. 
And lastly, just keep moving. For some of us, <laughs> it may simply be just walking every day, walking on a regular schedule. For others, um, it may be more um, intense exercise, but if you keep moving, you'll improve with time. So those are my thoughts for right now, but um, I hope uh, maybe I can answer some questions for you all. That was great, Tamara. Thank you so much for, um, for presenting that. We do actually have, we have lots of comments, um, several people, you know, agreeing with what you're saying, particularly about progress and, and you know, how it, it comes eventually, but it's not, you know, it's not always quick. It's not always the way that people want it to be. But um, we had a couple uh, question a couple of times. You may have actually touched on this a little bit in your talk, but um, several people wanted to know how, um, how long the surgery lasts. I know that's different for everybody, but generally um, how long that lasts. And then how, um, again, how long you're typically in the hospital? Okay. Yeah, those are good questions. The first question I'll try my best to answer, but as you said, it's very variable depending on the size of the tumor and the location of the tumor and the approach, um, surgical approach. But in general, I would say our um, surgeries last from about four to six hours um, in time. In terms of admission, um, typically it's on average about a three-day admission. I think the soonest we would send patients home would be on post-operative day two. And of course, if there's any concerns or um, you know, uh, sl slow progress, then we will keep you as, as needed. So I'd say three days average. Okay. Um, and what about patients who travel to get their care? Mm -hmm. So um, I know that you guys have a lot of patients that come from out of state. So when they need to go home and get follow-up care, who do they need to see? That's a good question and a very common question that we hear all of the time. Um, a lot of our patients um, definitely connect with your PCP. You'll be seeing your PCP before your surgery for your preoperative clearance. So um, that's a good way to connect with them before and after, as I talked in, about in the talk. It's good to connect with them um, because of any um, associated um, diagnoses you may have after surgery. And then often patients may have a local ENT that have referred them to, to see us um, that they follow up with. And also if, for example, um, they are a patient with single-sided deafness, they'll have an ENT team with an audiologist near home um, that they can refer to for um, management of hearing aids and those sort of things. Okay. Um, but for the most part, and one more thing I'd like to add, yep, go ahead. Um, was that we generally, for patients coming here to UCSD, uh, UC San Diego, we have um, a period that we like patients to stay in town. And that's uh, generally about eight to 10 days post-op. And we feel at that point when we have you come for your post-operative visit, we can determine if you'll be safe to travel home and and if we feel you're safe at that time, usually you're out of the woods for most major um, complications. Okay, great. Um, and what kind of things should, um, do patients need to have with them? Do they need to have at home for follow-up care or do they need to take with them out of the hospital once they're discharged? Um, well, you should be able to have everything um, provided to you when you go home. For example, we have a discharge pharmacy right in the hospital, so we will be able to provide you with your pain medications, your nausea medications. If you need something for stool softening from narcotic use, we'll have that. If you have dry eye, we can send you home with eye, um, eye drops. Uh, sometimes patients do, uh, I find, um, bring with them different pillows wedge pillow because after discharge we do recommend you uh, keep your head elevated for about 30 uh, about 30 degrees for the two to three weeks after surgery to um, to keep the intracranial pressure from building um, so some patients find it useful to um, bring their own pillow with them for their comfort it's not necessary but definitely something people like to have um, 
And those are the main things. One thing I can think of offhand too is if you are, wear glasses, um, it's good to have maybe something where you can take off uh, an arm of your glass if you have a dressing on your head just to loosen that arm so the glasses fit. If you're dependent on glasses, that might be useful to have. Um, but I think most everything else we can provide for you while you're, okay. while you're here. It's interesting that you mentioned the glasses because um, somebody just asked about incision dents mm -hmm. and um, what's normal for that and what can we do to help from getting them more pronounced and she said her glasses, she thinks are making it a little bit worse. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have a magic uh, treatment, but uh, just in general, pr probably finding a pair of glasses that don't have the pressure on that portion of the head may be helpful in the mm -hmm. short term, at mm -hmm. least. Um, and we did have a question about visitors after mm -hmm. surgery, which I'm sure in this um, COVID-19, yeah. you know, time is even different than, than normal, but um, what, you know, maybe before that all kind of came about, yeah. what is the rule of thumb there? Yeah, so under normal circumstances, our hospital encourages visitors, and it, I think it is so extremely helpful um, for the patients to have visitors with them and also to have a caregiver with them to, to understand um, the recovery process. Um, but currently, we are not allowed to have any uh, visitors only for a short period the day of the surgery um, before and after the surgery. Um, I hope that will change soon, but as of right now, it, it's not seeming likely to change in the short term. Okay. Um, and we had a question about, um, about other conditions. Um, do, do you find that many of the patients that you see have um, other conditions before their surgery that they're having to, to deal with, perhaps, you know, arthritis or anything else that, that sort of adds to their recovery? Um, meaning, should, should those issues be addressed before they consider surgery? Um, they're just, I think they're just asking if many patients have, um, if you see a lot of patients with, yeah other conditions or, you know, are most of your patients um, yeah. only dealing with the acoustic neuroma recovery? I think, I think they're wondering maybe, you know, is it, is it still doable even if you have something like, yeah. um, I'm trying to find the question that mm -hmm. specifically talks about, um, it was a type of arthritis, oh, rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, we, I don't think it would be a limitation to having surgery and we would just have to manage if you're on any type of long-term medication for the rheumatoid arthritis. Arthritis, we would um, talk to your PCP um, regarding management of that. Okay. Um, um, oh, she said she was thinking actually like cancer or something like that, but... Um, mm -hmm. Well, definitely cancer would probably go into the decision-making tree at the time of management of your AN and, and deciding which pathway to take. Mm -hmm. Okay. We definitely had patients with history of um, cancer. Okay. And um, we had someone else ask about the, um, and again, I know you would only be able to answer for your center, but mm -hmm. how, um, how, the hospitals managing the COVID-19, like pre and post surgery, what precautions are being taken to protect the patient and that kind of thing. Right, so here at UC San Diego, um, we are currently testing all um, patients uh, 72 hours prior to surgery. Um, they're not allowing uh, visitors as we talked about, family members, um, or, or if they are on a very restricted basis. Um, they are also um, keeping any COVID positive patients um, in certain areas of the hospital. So fortunately, the units where our patients um, are, are um, taken care of um, are usually COVID free areas where there is no COVID. Um, so I think fortunately, California um, was very aggressive at the onset of COVID. So fort fortunately, um, we've been 
doing pretty well in that regard. Okay, great. Um, and we had a couple questions about positioning during surgery and neck pain. Mm -hmm. So um, are there, if you have chronic neck pain, are there certain, um, do they kind of adjust the positioning for surgery to allow for that and, and um, I mean, deal with that? Yeah, I think um, they would just have to, they may be able to do some minor adjustments, um, but of course, depending on the surgical approach, they'll need to position your head in such a way to optimize the surgery. So um, to that, I think we would manage the post-operative um, neck pain aggressively okay. after surgery. Um, and then you mentioned earlier intracranial pressure. So are there other restrictions after you leave the hospital that, um, you know, like lifting or lifting limitations or whatever that um, the patients will have and how long will those go on? Yeah, thanks, Melissa, because I forgot to touch on that. But those are some standard um, precautions we give at the time of discharge that um, you want to keep at the head of the bed, like we said, at least a 30 degree angle. We don't want you to lift anything heavier than like a gallon of milk. And we don't want you to bend over. So we want you your, we don't want your head below your heart. And all of those restrictions we keep in place for about two to three weeks after surgery. We'll usually discuss that at the post-operative visit. Okay. And um, what, do you, what do you say to patients who are concerned about the narcotics that they have to deal with, um, you know, right after surgery and, and who are concerned about being on those for too long or potentially being in too much pain? What do you, how do you advise your patients on that? Right. I find um, um, a lot of our patients are very um, nervous about narcotic use. And I agree. Um, I think if you don't need to take narcotics, I try not to encourage them, but there are scenarios in the post-operative period. And usually it's a very short period of time that you may need narcotics. So um, it, it is a balance. Um, um, but I, I, at the same time, uh, withholding too much pain medication can uh, result in you ending up back in the hospital, possibly for pain control if you get behind on the pain. So there is a fine balance. But what I can say is that although uh, we do um, give you pain medicine after surgery and it is a craniotomy, I'm always surprised how soon our patients can wean off of the narcotics. So usually it's not more than um, a week's time and they'll be off the narcotics. I think again, off also the adjunctive therapies that um, we use with uh, you know the topical treatments and Dr. Chen have also helped um, decrease our, our narcotic use. Also, um, after the period um, from surgery to the post-op visit, which is roughly about eight to 10 days, um, we generally can resume the use of NSAIDs, so ibuprofen and Aleve, and that helps tremendously with pain control. So we can, at that point for sure, generally get you off of narcotics. Okay, great. Um, and how long, and I, I think this is another question that I'm sure would be different from patient to patient, but how long once people get home, um, do they need to have, um, you know, constant care, someone in the house with them all the time or, or with them all the time um, as they go through their recovery? That's a good question. And it, it, of course, it is going to be quite variable. But um, I would say at the time of discharge, you should be generally safe to be able to walk around and get to the bathroom by yourself. But you are going to want to have someone there assisting with your meds and assisting with, uh, you know, your meal preparation and making sure you're safe around the house. Uh, probably the first week uh, to 10 days will be most critical. And then thereafter, um, you'll probably be feeling well to be on your own and have someone near, you know, a phone, a phone call away um, mm -hmm. thereafter. Um, but you may still need some additional care, but not, you know, 24 seven around the care, okay. around the clock care, care. And then we get a lot of questions too about, you know, when can I drive and when can I go back to work and that sort of thing. So what, what about that? Yeah. So that's also quite variable. Um, we've had 
patients working a, from home a day or two after surgery, which is uh, always surprising to me, uh, to other patients needing a good um, eight to 12 weeks. Uh, some of it is dependent on the type of work you do. Uh, of course, if you have a physically demanding job, that's going to probably take more time to recover. Also, if you have a job where you're in a um, uh, environment where there's lots of input visually and um, sound wise and things like that, that can also be stressful to you. Um, but I would say on average, probably um, it's six to eight weeks before most patients go back to work. In terms of driving, I'd say about three to four weeks is a rough guideline, also variable. Um, there's no certain test per se that you have to um, pass to be able to drive again, but um, usually I recommend you start by sitting in the passenger seat with um, the driver and just do head turns as if you were driving to kind of practice to gauge how you're feeling about that. And also physical therapy and um, vestibular therapy, your vestibular therapist can also help uh, guide you in that process as well. Okay. And we've had a couple um, questions about insurance. Um, someone wanted to know if insurance typically covers the surgery and then someone else wanted to know some about um, disability and how long the doctors typically um, you know, write or document recovering time for um, a disability application. Yeah, so um, in terms of insurance, uh, generally, yes, it, it, it should be covered. It's not, it, it is somewhat elective in terms of the timing, but um, it should be covered by insurance um, for sure based on uh, the diagnosis. And in terms of disability, um, again, that can be variable just as we talked about uh, the return to work date. Um, I would say again, roughly six to eight weeks as a starting point, um, maybe, maybe longer depending on specific needs. Okay. And um, before we got started, you and I were talking about steroids and you said you had, you often got questions from patients about whether or not they would get steroids um, as part of their um, going home package. So um, how do you determine who gets steroids and who doesn't? Right. So everybody will get perioperative steroids. So uh, steroid coys just right around the time of surgery. Um, but most patients um, will stop uh, the steroids at the, by the time of discharge. Though there are some scenarios where we will keep the steroids going. And one of those scenarios is for patients having hearing preservation. We often do uh, an extended course of prednisone um, for hearing pre if you've had hearing preservation surgery. And the other scenario um, is if there is some facial nerve weakness, um, we may also give you a course of steroid to help with healing there and swelling. Okay, and you mentioned um, hearing preservation. So um, we often have patients ask, is the hearing when they wake up, is that what they're going to have? Is there gonna be any kind of improvement? Will it change? How does that work? Right. Right. Well, we usually, we generally have a sense at the time immediately after surgery, when you wake up from surgery, if you have hearing or not, though the extent can be, sometimes it can be a little bit tricky because um, first of all, immediately after surgery, you'll have the large dressing covering the ear. And also sometimes there can be fluid in the ear and that can give, um, um, you know, can muffle the hearing to some degree. Um, so, but usually while you're in the hospital, we'll be able to tell if there's some sort of hearing or not. The extent of the hearing may vary, um, like maybe you, you may re regain some more hearing as time passes, the dressing comes off, the fluid improves. Um, so we typically have a audiogram scheduled for our patients at the time of the post-operative visit. And that's the one we usually uh, use to de definitively assess their, their post-operative hearing. Okay. And then you also mentioned um, the facial nerve. And I know that um, we'll talk much more in depth about this 
um, tomorrow. Um, no, not tomorrow. Today's only Tuesday. On Thursday, <laughs> um, we will have a presentation um, with Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Green where they will speak in depth about the facial nerve. But you said um, that you don't usually like to do anything with the facial nerve immediately after surgery. Can you explain why you do that and, and then how long um, people should wait potentially or, or even when they might start to see improvement? I know that's something that, um, yeah. that patients often ask about. Yeah, that is, that is true. Um, in patients that do have some facial nerve weakness and uh, meaning the nerve is intact, but there it is a little weaker than normal, um, it will um, improve with time, but unfortunately it can take some time. And I know that's very frustrating for patients because you know you want the surgery to be behind you and then you want the, everything to kind of start with your new, new normal, but the facial weakness can take several weeks Till you start to see some improvement. Not always, sometimes sooner, but it, it, I just encourage patients on that. We don't like to do any, um, the physical therapy team does not like to start any um, physical therapy until you've started to at least see some re, uh, regaining of motion of the facial nerve. And that is because they don't want to um, cause any synkinesis or anything, um, any unusual um, movements um, with too aggressive therapy early on. And I don't think it is, although it may feel like um, you're helping because, you know, you want to do something. I, I would understand that uh, feeling that you want to feel like you're doing something to make it improve. Um, too much therapy early on, I don't know that it will um, majorly change the outcome. But just general motion of the face, that's, that's okay immediately post up. Okay. And um, you also mentioned um, that UCSD particularly, but I'm sure other centers as well, um, like to have patients who travel stay in the area for eight to 10 days to make sure that any kind of critical complication um, is handled there. So when patients leave the hospital, but they're staying there for that time, where do they typically stay? Um, our patients typically stay in hotels or like an Airbnb um, close to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Some have family members also in the area and they are able to stay with them. Okay. There are some housing op options also with um, affiliated with UCSD, some other resources as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, patients stay in hotels or Airbnb type scenarios. Okay. And um, one last question, we're getting to the end of our time, but someone asked about shampoo. So it made me think, mm -hmm. and you may have addressed this in your talk and I might've missed it, but um, like how long after surgery can um, patients shower and wash yeah. their hair and all of that? I like to wait until post-op day three and often patients are still in the hospital at that time. And sometimes it's nice if they can take a shower when they're in the hospital, depending on the floor they're staying on. Um, mm -hmm. Not always a possibility. Um, and that just gives them a little confidence, I think, um, before going home, especially with them being from out of town and being in a foreign setting. Sure. Um, and usually just any shampoo, gentle shampoo, baby shampoo, if you'd like. Um, and we just wash normally. We let the soapy water run over the incision and just make sure the incision is really dry. We've really gotten away from putting any type of ointments on the incision. We feel just keeping the incision clean and dry is, um, is helpful to avoid infection. Great, great. Well, I think we've gotten through all the questions and I want to thank, and it's just exactly um, an hour. So I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and go through all these slides and answer all these questions and talk to us about what to expect, because I know that that is definitely one of the um, scariest parts about all of this is just how that recovery is going to go. And I know it's really unknown for a lot of people. Um, before I let you go, I do want to make one quick announcement. Um, we were scheduled to have two presentations tomorrow. We were going to talk to Dr. Kari in the morning about um, the management of hearing, and we are still going to do that. Um, at, and it'll be at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern. 
Um, we were also going to speak to Vu Athens about meditation and mindfulness at um, 1.30 tomorrow afternoon, Pacific, 4.30 Eastern. But unfortunately, we're going to have to reschedule that event. So we will be in touch and let you know as soon as we are able to get a date um, to reschedule that, but we will not be able to have that event tomorrow. So um, I just wanted to let you know that. And, and thank you again, mm -hmm. Tamara. That was really very, very helpful. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. And thanks everyone for joining. Hope to see you soon. Thank you.